right, we will let people in as they come. Okay. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Brother Mike. Uh, thought I saw someone come in as well. Uh, here comes Elder Barry. Uh, welcome to start. Uh, what's that slogan you gave, Sister Audrey? I like that. I can't remember it right now. What was that you said? Uh, I think I got it now. Time to refresh. Time to refresh. That's the, the uh, tagline you put on that invitation. Time to refresh. Time for a fresh start. There's no shame in that. We're all going to get a fresh start. This, uh, we're going to go ahead and get things going here. Uh, this is... Uh, who we are, Southeast Seventh Day Adventist Church. And uh, for the members, we're saying that for people who will come in and don't know, or folks who may run across this video uh, somewhere out there in, on the internet, on some kind of social media, we want to let them know how to get in touch with us. Uh, we do broadcast weekly uh, on uh, Tuesday night for this study on Wednesday night for prayer meeting that also has a, another study with it on Friday night for Sabbath school that begins at, uh, at 8 p.m. There's something right before that for the kids and on Saturday morning at noon. So here's how you can find us. You can find all that information and more at se7day.org. Uh, this is the material that we're using. Uh, you can find it at the Adventist Book Center. If you hang into the class, we're going to provide it for you, no matter uh, where you are. If you're participating in the class, we will provide a special edition of Sign of the Times for you so that you can follow along with each lesson. Uh, we'll also be publishing uh, a uh, short version of a calendar so that you'll know what lesson is happening on what week so that will be helpful if there's something near and dear to your heart that you really want to get into then you can know what week we're doing that lesson all right it's time to start something new let's pray uh sister uh val can you pray for us yes thank you heavenly father for this opportunity to to be fed of your word and we pray for all that are on this um, platform that we will um, be happy that we are able and that we will serve thee when we're done in your name amen amen thank you thank you so much well last week uh, we we started off with the scripture. We started off with the Bible real is God real. And this week we're going on to lesson number two. It's called in the lesson book, the Trinity. I prefer to use the Godhead. I guess it's not something that we need to fight over. The, uh, the idea is that three co-eternal persons is what we mean when we say God. And we're going to define that tonight. Get your feedback on it. And then we're going to let you go right at 8 o'clock. How about that? I am Pastor Stan Hood. This is Lesson 2 of Fresh Start, the Trinity. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I put this up here first because it's going to take us four weeks to talk about who God is. Tonight, it is what does it mean when we say God? And then next week, we're going to talk about the Father. The next week, we're going to talk about the Son. And the following week, we will talk about the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about them all shortly and briefly tonight, but just trying to understand the relationship between all three of them. I know this is something that people have asked over the years about the relationship between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. People have even asked me, well, who exactly do I pray to? Do I pray to Jesus? Do I pray to the Father? Do I pray to the Holy Spirit? 
We're going to answer all of those questions within the next few weeks, starting tonight. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Somebody said it, one of the teachers said it earlier before y'all came on, three in one. All right, just want to remind you of this little nugget from last week. I love it when a non-believer goes seeking for the truth about the Bible and about God. An agnostic astronomer, now we see how the astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The chain of events leading to man commenced suddenly and sharply at a definite moment in time in a flash of light and energy. Robert Jastrow. And this flash of light is not the Big Bang. The Big Bang theory is not a sudden beginning date, a definite beginning date for uh, our universe. The Big Bang says a lot of little stuff bumped into a lot of other stuff and then it became us and we are the stuff. Now, if you believe that, that takes more faith than what we're teaching tonight. All right. So let's go on and get into the lesson because it's going to be interesting. Christianity is the only religion that distinguishes itself with a general belief about a real living God who exists as three distinct persons who are equal and eternal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you look at the major religions of this world, um, even the mythological ones, they're all fighting with these ego issues. They're all backstabbing and doing things to each other. And they're also doing things to their servants to torture them. Not so in Christianity. Christianity desires for all mankind to reach their maximum potential. And the way that we get there is our own God died for our sins. So very different than other religions. And we're going to have a good time talking about that going forward. But uh, let's talk about God the Father. Who are these three co-eternal persons? We begin with the Father. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came. One God, and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. Ephesians 4 and verse 6. That's who the Father is. All right? Moving right along. God the Son. Number two. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So the Son is in bodily form, and yet he is still God, Colossians 2, 9. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, Titus 2, verse 13. Number three, the third person in the Godhead is the Holy Spirit. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit. You have not lied to men, but to God. So here in Acts 5, 3, Peter is calling the Holy Spirit God. All right. Okay, so any questions about who the Godhead is? Any questions about who the Godhead is? All right, I see head shaking. I see no movement with anybody else. All right, Sister Audrey, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Can you read 1 Corinthians 2.11 for us? For what human being knows what is truly human except the human spirit that is within. So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the spirit of God. Wow. Wow. Well, that is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. The Trinity 
in the Bible. We're going to explain that statement in our next section. Each lesson is broken down into three sections. We just finished the first one. That we'll define who are the Godhead, three in one. Now let's look at the Bible perspective. What are they saying about this concept of God? All right, Sister Donna, you still there with us? Yes, I am. All right, nice, loud, and clear. Uh, if you can read Genesis 1, 1 and 2 for us, and we can launch into a discussion about that. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. All right. Praise the Lord. So there are two members of the Godhead. Oh, let me see here. Okay. Well, somebody's trying to get in. There are two members of the Godhead presented right at the beginning of Genesis. Uh, can you close that for me, Michael? Um, so can somebody identify who is identified in Genesis 1 and verse 2? Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Close. We got God himself and the Holy Spirit. Hey, Brother King, man. Yes, the Father and the Holy Spirit are in action. They're taking action in the act of creation in the first two verses. We are introduced, Moses is the author here, and we understand that at the time of this writing, Moses has now spent significant amount of time with God or in God's presence on, the, on, on this mountain. And uh, God comes to him, calls him to him, and they have these series of private conversations where Moses is being taught by God. And so what now has been an oral tradition becomes a written tradition. And Moses doesn't have to get it secondhand. He gets it directly from God. First sentence, in the beginning, God. And what we mean here is the Father. Second verse, the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the waters. So they are co-creating, but they have two different functions. Do we see that in, in Genesis 1, 1 and 2? Yes, absolutely. All right. All right. Uh, if some, let me see here, see if I can. Um, any of you, uh, you know, Bill Johnson? No. If you, Billy Johnson, the prison ministry guy. If you yes. can. Yes. Yeah, yes. Send the link for how to get in. He's having trouble getting in. Okay, Good. I can send it to him. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Yeah, because I can't pay attention to that and, and teach at the same time. So thank you so much. All mm -hmm. right. So we have two of the three participating in creation. We see it obviously right at the beginning of the lesson, right at the beginning of the scripture. So where is Jesus? Jesus is right here in John 1, 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we learned earlier in a few slides back that Jesus is God represented in bodily form. Remember that? Yes. Right here on this side, God the Son. For in Christ, all, all the fullness of the deity lives in see it? bodily form. Colossians 2, 9. So if the Father, then if the Father is speaking creation, let there be. Right? The Spirit of God is moving. 
there's something supernatural happening to the earth as the spirit moves over it, then Jesus would be the one who walks and kneels down and forms Adam in his own image and breathes the breath of life into him and asks, where are you? Who would meet him and teach him, name the animals. So here's a simple formula that I have been able to maintain and trust me, those memory cells are going by the minute, but I remember this, the father talks, the Holy Spirit moves and Jesus walks. Mm -hmm. Easy way to remember the different responsibilities of the Godhead. The father speaks, so the father talks, mm -hmm. the spirit moves and Jesus walks. Everybody got that? Or you got a better one? You say, ah, oh, Pastor Hood, mine is better. If you have a better one, let me know. There's no, there's no bad way to say it as long as those distinctions are made. Remember, this is how we can reconcile some scripture that says no man has seen God. But we clearly see Jesus showing out, showing up throughout the scripture. He shows up in the garden. He shows up to Abraham and Sodom and Gomorrah. He shows up with Cain and said, man, what's wrong with you? Your countenance has fallen. So is the Bible lying when it said no man has seen God? No, it's saying no man has seen the Father. Because the only thing that's keeping us from being destroyed is the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. God in bodily form. A question. Sure. When we are constantly being reminded that no man has seen God. And then later on in the Bible, Jesus says that the Father and I are one. So when you see me, you see the Father. Mm -hmm. So that my um, interjection is, is that we have a confirmation that uh, Jesus being a, a person of color reflects that God has that same composition. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, you can have that. Uh, but uh, I, I think that could be true. But I, I think the, the Lord is the author of all people. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the region in which he chose to, to present himself is definitely a place of color. We would be, we would be, we would laugh if, um, we presented all of our imagery in Christianity mm -hmm. as uh, if Christian, say Christianity, the, the place where all the origins begin, say it was Switzerland or say it was Russia and all of our artwork presented him as a black man with dreads, people would laugh at that because it wouldn't make sense because of where these stories take place. Gotcha. However, we don't laugh at the opposite of that <laughs> with Jesus having blonde hair and blue eyes and, and not just white skin, but glowing white skin in the middle of Africa. We just kind of go, okay, you know. So I, I see the point there. Uh, and I'll say what I said this morning uh, in our, our, our prayer line time. Uh, when somebody asked me about the images, I said, look, I'm not trying to get rid of anybody. I just want people of color to be included. That right. would be the crime, right? The crime would not be that other nationalities are represented. The crime is that Black people aren't included in a place that consists of almost all Black people. Come on, that, T. That would make sense. But, but what I believe when Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, He's speaking of their character, what constitutes them, that, that um, powerful substance that has no words, that thing that man cannot explain, which is eternal, uh, that whatever makes God eternal, I mean, think about that. Can we wrap our mind about there was no beginning for him? Can we really wrap our mind, who made him? Right, <laughs> no one, because he always was. I think that is what Jesus is speaking to. Yeah. So let's let's go. We have on. a question here. Oh, okay. There's a a question. comment. Go ahead, Barb. Go ahead. Um, Pastor uh, Hood. Yes, ma'am. This is Barbara Brooks. 
Uh, you know, the Bible really explains itself mm-hmm. when the when the scripture says that we are all created out of one out of one blood. Mm-hmm. God created the nations. Mm-hmm. So that is inclusive of all of us. Yes. You know, man is the one that makes the distinction uh, okay. between the races and, and the colors. But, mm-hmm. uh, but in reading scripture, there's no distinction. If God says that we are, he created mankind from one blood, then that's exactly what he did. Yes, that, that is true. The distinctions in our features uh, are mostly... Uh, climate, you know, uh, uh, circumstances in which we live. And over time, that code of DNA is passed down to the offspring that uh, where that child is fit to endure whatever climate that they are brought up in. I don't think that's such a big I- issue for people of color, but it was an issue for the race war that was taking place when Christianity spread from from the Middle Eastern countries to Europe, to Spain, and then eventually to America, Britain and America, when they were spreading it, it's quite documented at this time that they were also spreading white supremacy. So the imagery kind of went along with the form of Christianity that they were spreading. But here's the thing, when we become new creatures in Christ, that's less important to somebody who's really born again somebody who's not born again, they can't wrap their head around not being supreme. So let's go to the next verse. Uh, Sister um, uh, uh, Elder uh, Pam, are are you on? Yes. Okay, if you could read Colossians 1.16 for us, that'll take us right on where we need to go. Okay. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Wow. Now that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If before, before there is a earth or an outer atmosphere around the earth, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in council agree that Jesus, should man fall, that Jesus would die for man, then we should be made by him and for him because he's taken responsibility for us. All right, let's go on. We're going to talk again in a moment. Okay, Sister Val, can you come back? Matthew 3, 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. All right. All right. So here is uh, first, I'm going to start with our guests and then come back to the teachers. Uh, Do you see God in this verse? Meaning three in one. Well, somebody dropped off. You see three in one in this verse. Okay. Nobody's answering. So. uh, Come on in, come on in. We're gonna let the teachers in. We gave them a shot. Now you uh, go ahead. <laughs> well, it began speaking about Jesus, okay? When he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water. Um, and lo, the heavens were opened up to him and he saw the spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit, descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And then the voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Mm-hmm. What did she do? So so just to recap, and and you are absolutely correct, Sister Donna, you see all three personalities of the Godhead in the same place functioning, functioning independent of one another. Is that not true? 
Yeah. Yeah, that is so true. So this 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 Gnosticism, uh, which crept up in the early days of the apostles, said that, well, it was one God just changing forms depending on what we needed at the time. God is one person, which is the Father. And you now hear that in this in the Hebrew Israelite movement, uh, you know, uh, which is basically kind of a kind of a comic book version of of uh, Islam, you know, dress up and everything, right? But the whole idea is God has no son. Mm-hmm. Now, Islam has that buried within its it, it in the Quran, but it is there that Jesus is a wonderful prophet indeed, but he is not God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus not just is God, but he always was God. All right. All right. Any, any, I just wanted to say um, that when I looked at that and I looked back at your, at the notes that we have, remember you said the father talks, Mm -hmm. you see in 17, 17, Mm -hmm. there's father talking, okay? And the spirit moves. We saw the spirit of God descending. That's moving. Mm-hmm. And then um, Jesus went up straightway out of the water. That's Jesus walking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he walked right up to him. And, and, and John didn't want to baptize him, right? He said, I'm not even worthy, you know, to tie yes. up your shoelaces. Or however, he said that. Because Jesus came walking. God came walking up to them saying, baptize me. Now wrap your mind around that. Right. <clears throat> He's our perfect example. So this God knows that we need this face to face encounter. He also knows that we need to be comforted, that we need to be healed from the inside. We need to be taught from the inside. And he also knows that we need someone watching over us that never sleeps or never slumbers. So God is saying, I got you in every way that you could possibly have a need. Can y'all see that? Oh yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, thank you, Jesus. Yes, this is, there. there's nothing that compares to what God is presenting to us here. Uh, so we're gonna talk more about it. I'm trying not to get ahead of myself, but we have a couple of, of weeks to go. Uh, Sister Audrey, if you could take us to Luke 135. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So you see it again. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is moving. And there's a power from on high orchestrating this. And then here's the son of God in physical form, being born of a virgin. See it? Yep. So there, they are distinctive. I think this is what the lesson is trying to show us. And so uh, let's get one of our uh, guests, uh, somebody who's not a teacher tonight to read John 15, 26. Don't be shy, (laughs) y'all. I'll take it if no one else is available. Mm -hmm. Let's get um, John, the 15th chapter, verse 26 from the King James Version. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, Mm -hmm. even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Man. Wow. Well, thank you so much for reading that, Brother King Man. Since you read it, I'm going to put you right on the hot seat. Does this sound like to you in John 15, 26, that the Holy Spirit and the Father are the same person? Uh, yes, and it also sounds and uh, amplifies that Jesus is speaking, so all three are present. Yes, perfect. I wish I could give you something for that. And all I can give you is a hand clap. 
<laughs> so yes, Jesus is the one talking in John 15, 26. He's speaking, so he's not talking about himself. He's speaking of the coming of the Holy Spirit who's being sent by God the Father. All three working for our salvation. All right, everybody's still with us? Yes. All right. So we're going into our last section of our lesson tonight. Remember, each lesson is three sections. The last section is arguments for God's existence. Arguments for God's existence. This should be fun. All right. So remember this from our first lesson, from lesson number one. We talked about mind and mood altering things. What we didn't get into is why people are so easily drawn into these kinds of addictions. Any thoughts on how, why people tend to be drawn into addictive behaviors? Anyone, anyone who? Historical. Go ahead. Historical. Historical. But, I mean, so, you could go back to day one and find somebody that was either had a bad attitude or was drunk. I mean, you know, so that's kind of just what I'm saying to be short with it. Mm -hmm. um, because of our separation from God, we, we realize there's something missing in our life. Yes. We don't know what it is. That spiritual component is missing. And so not being able to seek out God or search out God by searching for him, he finds us. We're, we're searching for him in the bottle and the needle, or they're searching for him in the bottle or needle or um, other mind altering. We, we buy things, we eat things. All of that is trying to uh, fill up that empty spiritual place. Yes, indeed. Diane has her hand raised. Go ahead, Diane. Uh, am I, am I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, I'm Go sorry. <laughs> no, I fine. sometimes think that it's true that there's like, there's, I saw a video one time of people who were overcoming their addictions and they said they always, every single one of them across all social economic classes talked about a hole in their life or an unfulfillment. And I also think that they go that way to cover pain because they don't have a way to cover pain or to, to feel um, ways to be um, comforted like from the Holy Spirit and God, they don't know comfort. So it's masking something that they can't adjust to as well, you know? Amen, Amen. very good. Y'all are getting down tonight. All right, Donna has her hand raised, go right ahead. I think, um... Addiction is one of the many strongholds that um, is the result of, of um, looking, looking for love in all the wrong places. You know, I mean, that's, that's the, the only way I can sum it up. I mean, if, you, if a person is kind of like what uh, Antoinette said, when a person goes through life and they're realizing, well, that sometimes they don't even realize why they're doing it, okay? They may not even realize that there's this void and see, I believe man was created with that void, with that void that only God can fill. And he knew he did that. Okay. And when they tried, you know, when they 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 tried to fill that void with the wrong things. And and that's and I think addiction is just um one of the strongholds that is the result of trying to fill that void um instead of going to God. Mm, very good, very good. Uh, Pastor, I just want to add to that, for just a, a little bit to that. I think lost of hope, and sometimes people have no hope and they get depressed. And um, to fill that void also, they turn to other things instead of turning to God. So that kind of, you know, give them a quick fix. And then when they all get um, feel better, you know, they they just go keep going back to the same thing because that problem and the pain is still there. So they're trying to mask, you know, mask that um, feeling and the feeling of pain and have no hope. And that's my thought. 
Yes, uh, everybody is right. I'm gonna go back to our very first answer from Sister Val, because everybody is, is right on the money. Uh, when she said, historically, you can trace it, right? So when Adam and Eve sin, and then their eyes are open, right? and they realize they have a feeling of being uncovered. Mm -hmm. And uh, that separation from God, remember that uh, Eve completes Adam, she comes out of Adam, and and in order for either of them to be fulfilled, they must come back together. Well, that is a, a type of relationship with God. We are unfulfilled. We are incomplete. We are actually designed to long for that completeness. And I believe that's what all of you are saying. Diane has her hand raised again. Come on back, Diane. You're on the <laughs> road. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so is the void that you that we speak of that God put in us to long for him, do you think that was placed after sin or was that before sin? Well, was sin? It, was, it was before sin. It's just that sin is a wall. Uh, it's a wall of separation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we need to be born again. Right? Uh, so the need for, for God existed when the Lord breathed into him because whatever was in God was breathed in him, right? So God doesn't, isn't just the author of our existence or the author of our faith. He is the sustainer. Look at it like um, drinks. There is an unlimited number of things you can drink. But if you don't drink water, you're going to have problems, <laughs> right? 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 You can have some lower form of existence, drinking soda, whatever you want to call it. But to be the best that you were created to be, you must have a healthy amount of water in your system. Why? Because you were designed to run on that. Does that make sense, Diane? Yes, that, that helps clarify. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I like I'm, it when you do that. I love it when you put it to I can voice I can understand it. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Thank I, you. I, I, Thank I, you. Preachers kind of overkill an explanation, so forgive me. <laughs> we all. But you know what? Yes. And once you become, you go after it trying to fill a void. But once you become addicted, that thing becomes your god, because yes. now you're trying to keep going back to it just to feel normal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very good point very good point uh that I, I i've been saying on the early morning prayer line that all the coffee addicts are just gonna drop off the line because I, I keep using this because it's the easiest example in all my professional career until i became a pastor i go in and people can't even talk to you until they get their coffee and if, if something is wrong with the coffee machine, you think they're going to snap out. <laughs> you know, it, it, handshaking. They need, it has now become uh, a necessary thing for them to even function. Is that what you're talking about, Dr. Pan? Yes, it uh, is. All right. Thank you so much. I know that the people who watch this are really going to appreciate uh, this part of the lesson, as Diane said, is, is just practical uh, talk. So um, I, I like having this conversation because it helps us with where we're going next. Remember, this last segment is called Arguments for God's Existence. And uh, if there's anything that preachers have to deal with all the time and Bible teachers and so you got to deal with objections or questions endless questions of you can't prove that God exists well today let's see if we can prove it okay so there are several arguments there's six arguments we're going to go through tonight and it's not going to take that long these are things that have been well thought out this battle has raged throughout uh, time and this is, these, these are the points that we've drawn down to, to help anyone understand the existence of God. The first one 
Uh, and, and by the way, let me say, some of them will resonate with you more than others. It doesn't mean any, there's something wrong with you or something wrong with the argument. We just all think different. There's only, you know, everybody doesn't think the same. So that's why some will come closer to you than others will. So let's start with the first one. Let's start with the first one. Somebody read this one for us, the moral argument. I can do that if you'd like. Sure. Um, the search of every human being for, quote, the best good, unquote, implies the existence of a moral being. Our conscience and our moral understanding distinguishes or distinguish us humans from the animals. There must be a source of moral insight. All right. So everybody understands this argument for the existence of God. Anybody need any further clarification? Okay, well, uh, um, you know I'm going to give it anyway. <laughs> it, it, this argument says the very fact that we have a conscience and that we feel guilty or we feel proud is evidence that there's something beyond the flesh mm -hmm. that put that in us. And if, if, if we have this awareness of whether we've done right or wrong, then that proves there is a God. Oh. And uh, one of the arguments for that is we see in nature that animals don't have that level of development. If it's, this is something that is purely uh, a function of existence, then why don't animals have this, uh, this same kind of conscience in, uh, in mass? Now you can see some levels of that in certain types of animals. But in general, uh, you know, it's simply, uh, uh, it, you know, operating on a loop. You know, the deer is always going to run out in the street, you know, the, <laughs> you know, and, and so on. The, the, the spider is always going to put his web and he's going to eat, you know, things like that. So uh, any thoughts on that before we go on to the next one? Um, yes, as I mentioned before, I have this puppy. He's a dog now. He's big. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking, oh, he's so smart. He acts like a real human being. But when I took him to the dog park and he started smelling and marking all the trees, I thought to myself, oh, he's just a dog. <laughs> <laughs> he's just a dog. <laughs> Look, my dog broke my heart because every day that dog will hear that car pull up and just go crazy. I mean, acting a fool. Can't for if if she could open the door, she would to get up and jump all over me and let me know how much she loved me and missed me. And uh, so I had to. I don't know what I was doing. I went out of town for something, and I left the dog with my secretary. And uh, and me and sisterhood went wherever. When we came back, don't you know the dog was doing the same thing for her? I said, you no good little hub. <laughs> I thought you loved me. But the truth is, anybody who's providing, that dog will do that for them. I was just devastated. So good point. All right, I thought I heard another voice before we go to number two. Yeah, that was me. I just wanted to um, propose a question to the group, if I may. Okay. Uh, in relation to, to this right here, what you just read. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible that maybe that's one of the reasons why God reveals himself? as three persons is to help us understand his greatness. Hmm. Hmm. I, had thought, I hadn't thought of that one. Okay. All right. Nobody's saying anything. I guess you dropped a bomb on us, Sister Donna. We, we can come back to that. Let's go to number two, the mental argument. All right. Dr. Pam, can you read that one? The mental argument. Our mental faculties, our imagination and intelligence can be explained only by presupposing the existence of a super intelligent source. All right. All right. What do y'all think of this one? I like that. That's awesome, Pastor. Hmm. Yeah, I wish I could take credit for it, but it was in the book. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you yeah. know, especially since we have uh, different, different people have different rates of um, intelligence. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it, it's all about it's it's the individualism is just you know how he worked it out. You know, each individual. Yeah, yeah. Look at our creativity as human beings. I, I think about it all the time. We're flying down the highway at 70. Some of us at 70. People like my <laughs> wife, maybe at 80, 85, 90. <laughs> going down the turnpike <laughs> and we know to stay on our side of the road going that fast and in general it's shocking when somebody doesn't right when when somebody doesn't follow those simple rules you know we know we're supposed to stop at the red light uh we're supposed to use caution at yellow let the person have the right of way for the stop sign these are interactive things and someone came up with these grids for our city. How about that? The sewer system, the high rises, the electricity, the lights, the internet that we're on now. It seems that our imagination, uh, that, uh, that our intelligence is only limited by our imagination. If we really want to do something, if it's physically possible, men and women will figure out how to do it. What do y'all think of that? Yeah, what's interesting to me is the fact that we have consciousness, mere mm. consciousness, which nobody really can explain the mind, but the mm. fact that we have consciousness and to find when you watch somebody die and just look at that consciousness or whatever it was is just gone. Right. That is like one of the most amazing things to see mm. a person go from life to death. Indeed. I see Galaxy Tab A, your hand is raised. Antoinette, yes. Yes. <laughs> um, the one thing I was watching uh, PBS last night, and they were doing a special on a, a woman in the 50s who was uh, a decoder. And she almost single handedly decoded all of these encrypted messages from the um, enemies who were waging war. Wow. And they had sealed her record. She could not tell even her husband what she had done. And so now 60 years later, now they have come out and told all of the work that she did. She wasn't paid the same level as but I'm, I'm saying this to say that for the encryption, mm -hmm. she, with a pencil and paper, wow. discovered the key that was used. Then by World War II, they had to bring her up out of retirement. They, two men came to her house. Oh, we, we need you. We need you. Because they had disbanded that whole unit. That was before the U.S. got their intelligence uh, branch of the government started. And here she was with her pencil and paper. And they had these um, machines that were putting out the code. And she went for six months, I believe it was, looking at endless code that was being transmitted and our U-boats were being bombed, the, the British U-boats were being bombed, I should say. And all of this stuff was going on, but someone made a mistake and you, they changed the key every day. That's what it was. They made a mistake and for a week, they used the same key. And that's how she was able to break their code. But the mind, whatever we are thinking that the computer, you know, and we're building faster and bigger and, um, we're not necessarily bigger, but higher uh, uh, gigabytes and te tetrabytes of information, even on our cell phones. But mm -hmm. our minds are able to do well. Some people's minds were able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the and, other thing is that no matter our imagination, no matter our intelligence, no matter our anything, we cannot create something from nothing. You cannot create life de novo. Right. right. Well, that's, and I, we won't stop trying, though. Right, go ahead. Pastor, Hello. 
Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say our mind can do these things, but we can only do them with the help of the Lord. If if he was not there giving us this uh, mental capacity, then we will be limited a lot in what we are doing. I was just reading the explanation there here where it says can be explained only by presupposing the existence of a super intelligent source. So we have to have somebody better than we are, better than our mind can, can, can uh, imagine in order to imagine these things and do these things. You know, yeah. he, he gives us the intelligent power to do it. Yes, and that is and that is this argument in a nutshell. I'm so glad you said that because you just summed it up. That's what this is all about. Okay, I see you, Sister Val. Go right ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, somebody can correct me, but Mrs. White, I was told Mrs. White said that we can contain the entire set of encyclopedia if we apply ourselves. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't, heard, haven't heard that one, uh, but Mental. I wouldn't doubt it because, uh, because I know uh, pastors uh, uh, and even some lay people who can literally recite chapters of the Bible like it's nothing, just recite the entire thing. I, I'm blessed that way yet, but I mean, I need to apply myself more. But let's go on because we want to finish on time. Number three. Uh, number three is the cosmological argument. I had to practice that, y'all. The cosmological <laughs> argument, number three. In view of the fact that every effect must have a cause, a never-ending chain of cause and effect must go back to the great first cause. Nothing can proceed from nothing. Wow. That's for the smart people in the room. <laughs> All right, so number three is cosmological. I have to break that down, cosmological. Uh, okay, go ahead, Antoinette. Well, see, now that's why some people believe that it couldn't have been, uh, the earth couldn't have come from nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, it was void and, and nothing. And then all of a sudden God says, let there, no, this very statement, nothing can proceed from nothing, but God, with God, all things are possible. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And also, uh, the oh, I'm sorry, even when he explains it to us, we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. We're finite, you know, we're finite. So he explains to us as much as we have the capacity to understand. Yes, absolutely. You know, science basically is trying to explain the cause from the effect. That's what science is, trying to explain what God has already created. Yes, absolutely. And to add to that, the very fact that it has the consistency that it's had over the years that you can now create expectations based on the consistency of nature. For me personally proves there is a creator. Yes, yes. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, oh, okay, uh, Sister Barbara and then Sister Diane. Um, Pastor, I just wanted to uh, interject the, the scripture that says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Mm -hmm. That in itself uh, will cause a lot of thought, you know. The mere yeah. fact that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, no matter how we try to explain things, still there's that area that says, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, ma'am. Great comment, Sister Diane. I wonder about things like this, and um, I firmly believe, and I don't know what you, you think about this, is 
that all science, all thing in end times are going to be going, are going to be showing that God is the answer, that all the sciences will conclude just like that, um, was it astronomer that you talked about before? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think that because truth is truth. It's just <laughs> the way it is. It's going to all, all mankind in all disciplines in life are going to all come to the same conclusion. God is our creator. But I think that we're, some people are more stubborn than others in, in knowing this. <laughs> we're yes. not as stubborn. <laughs> yes. It, it was, you know, um, I've been teaching on Samson every morning. And the one thing that is consistent that affirms what you just said is Samson's downfall is his dependence upon his strength. He knew God gave it to him, but he did not understand that God was continuing to give it to him. You, do you see what I mean? He believed that God made him that suit, gave him that supernatural strength. But what he lost sight of is every time he got ready to use it, God had to give it to him. He thought once God gave it to him, he just had it. And that was his downfall. Uh, I, saw, I saw Antoinette, but you know how to spell your name wrong? <laughs> Did you want to say something else? No, no, that's okay. Change your mind? Okay. All right, so, so, so let's go on and let's see where we, because these are good, aren't they? Yes. Number four, the intricate structure and design seen in nature from the butterfly to the human brain requires the existence of an intelligent designer. The teleological argument. Yo, I've been practicing, y'all. I've been practicing. The teleological <laughs> argument. Yeah, I had to go slow. <laughs> <laughs> what what do y'all think about that intricate structure that sounds like a dr pam question right there the intricate structure and design and anybody else who's been thinking about her somebody say they've been thinking about these things go ahead antoinette okay for me this they, they've named each of these different arguments or thought processes to declare the glory of God. Yes. That's what it sounds like to me. Uh, this is so far beyond anything that mankind can, can conceive. And the very fact that we are really just, if someone puts a, a, a bullet in us, our little brain will seep right out of our head. Or if they cut us, our lifeblood will, will, you know, we're just very intricate and delicate, just like that little butterfly. But in humanity, as a human being, we're more fearfully and wonderfully made, true. But it's actually just look at our skin. Our largest organ is, is very, you know, kind of thin. You, yeah. can, you can tattoo it or cut it or, you know, lotion it or whatever. But yeah. it's there for a purpose. It's like a, a balloon just mm -hmm. a thin skin of a balloon, but it holds all of our essence together. Mm. Very good, very good. And, and not only that, not only that, but it also um, synthesizes things such as vitamin D from the sun. Uh, it absorbs things, but when in my studies, um, Pastor, when, when we studied health and I entered into my, um, physiology and um, anatomy classes. Yes. We studied anatomy, which is the actual um, body and then physiology, which is the systems. Well, the human body operates through electric and liquid, you know? And that's mm -hmm. the only way that, they, that's the only place that these two can work together and not be catastrophic is within the human body. Mm. And God did that. God did that. Or oh, Jesus did that. Yeah. Say that one more time. Water <laughs> and electricity. <laughs> Somebody else is talking. Go ahead. Now you said that that water and electricity is that's the only place where um, they can work together is in the human body. 
Those That's right, and not, and not be catastrophic. Excellent, yes. Yeah, I've been going to hold on to that. I might preach that, Sister Donna. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> but then look at the brain. Look at the brain. Okay, the brain looks like a big bag of worms. That's mm -hmm. all. And just like she said, you put a bullet through your head, it's going to seep out. Where is the mind? What mm -hmm. is the mind? Yeah. Like and how do we get yeah. the mind of Christ, which the Bible said, let this mind be in you that yeah. is in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Yes, indeed. This is good. We're almost done. The ontological argument. Ansel, Ansel, the 11th century Archbishop of Canterbury, defined God as that which nothing greater can be conceived. He reasoned that life must be a necessary part of such a perfect being, and therefore he must exist. Oh, they're getting deep. I ain't even had dinner yet. And they want me to say ontological. <laughs> I'm <gonna be> <laughs> this definition, Pastor. Yeah, that definition is something. Since we can't conceive anything greater than God, then that is proof that God exists. That's an interesting one. What do y'all think? Yeah, it is. Definitely on point. Because wow. God cannot be explained or written down or, or totally comprehend by us nor by any forms of communication other than to experience it in truth and in, in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't give me a better explanation is what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And since I'm wrong, show me something better. Interesting, interesting argument. Let's go on to the next one because that one looks like it might be over my head. Number six, the experience <laughs> argument. Human religious experiences, which are such a common part of our human existence, indicate that there must be something or someone behind them. The floor is yours. What do y'all think about number six, the experience argument? I think that's the most powerful pastor because it uh, because we we can it's it's on a level that the human finite mind can um, relate to, uh, which is the actual experience. But you know, a lot of people say that the human religious experience is the result of electrical firing in the brain, like a seizure or something. I'm sure you've heard that. Yes, I have. That's the explanation for prophecy, actually. Then I for, must have a lot of seizures um, then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for uh, for for speaking in tongues, for um, getting an uh, euphoria during worship. Uh, you know, something similar to a mother needs to get her baby from under that car and suddenly she can lift it. You know, mm. something similar to that. Go ahead, Diane. Do we have to make the experience um, that uh, that um, big? Because I think like I'm working in, in a warehouse right now and as I'm trying to put some boxes on the shelf and everything, God reveals to me about how he gave his, how Peter had to learn about to, you know, to do God's will. And then Jesus had to do God's will. And I've known this forever, but then it really struck me. And all, I almost dropped the box. So to me, these little moments that I have prove to me that God exists because he's talking to me. He's, it, it's not like, not like the talk that we always know. But once we come into the faith, we know that these things happen. We say, wow, there's God. I know my God. So I don't know. I don't think it has to be that big. No, but if we did, I would have a lot of seizures. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Go ahead, Antoinette. I, I don't want us to, uh, I don't think that it's only limited to uh, Christian holy experiences because there are spiritual experiences that are experienced by people who practice uh, devil worship. Mm-hmm. 
and and have demon possession. And so I, I think that it, it it has to entail the whole, there are forces beyond what we can see. Yeah, well, good point. What we can hear or feel. So mm -hmm. if something or someone is beyond our physical uh, physical experience, yeah. yeah. And that's a, that's a great point that's often left out. The, the opposite of holiness also proves that there's something more. Uh, uh, I believe the strongest um, way to make this argument is the ability to overcome. That is something that uh, is found in the will that is not always evident. Uh, that's why I like showing these addictions because everybody understands addiction. Nobody's arguing that addictions don't exist. Now I can go from speaking with a non-believer to ask them to explain if you're in the jaws of addiction and you don't have the will to overcome, what brought you out? Go ahead, uh, Sister, uh, Sister Donna. Oh, no, I was just um, looking at it and I, I just see the word human in here twice. So, you know, I mean, if we're going to relate to it on a, on, a, on a flesh level, which is the best we can do as humans, then, you know, that was just like our key operative in this to me. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think what it's trying to say, let's read it again. For those who can't, uh, can't see the screen, human religious experiences. So humans have some experience that you would argue is not human. That, that, that they're, not com they're not a normal part of our lives. Something extra happens. And we're trying to figure out in number six, where does that come from? So it's not that it's generated out of your humanity. I think it's saying the opposite, that it's inexplicable on a human level, or am I on the wrong track? Right track. Well, I looked at after the comma it said, which are such a common part of our human existence. And that right. just so, kind of Yeah, well, it maybe it's poorly, it's poorly written maybe, but the idea is so, so many people have had these supernatural experiences. That I was trying to say, because again, I didn't okay. write it, I just, Kind of, but yeah, I see they could have written that a little better, but it's trying to say that supernatural things have happened to, that happened to to humans, that humans cannot generate these supernatural occurrences. Okay, thank you for clarifying that for me. Yeah, well, thank you for pointing out, maybe we should write them and tell them, hey, y'all need to rewrite this little part right here. <laughs> because it can be, and we do, we, you know, I've seen little things like that in Sabbath school lessons, They're kind of like, what, you know, because people write them, right, people write those lessons and submit them so they can make um, errors, or they could have improved on what they wrote, and I think this, once you pointed it out, it could have been written a little better, the only reason I know it is because it's a part of the school of theology, you have, <laughs> have to know these, maybe I would see this differently if I didn't already know the argument, okay? So- but Where uh, does faith enter into this? Well, we're getting there. Oh, we got, okay. This is week one of four talking about the Godhead. The first week is just in general. It says the Trinity, which I'm really not a fan of that word, but I understand why people use it because everybody knows what it's supposed to mean, but Next week, we'll go the Father, the following week, the Son, next week, the Holy Spirit. So we're going deeper into this conversation. And please invite people who are looking for some place to have this conversation. Because I think it's been a, I thought last week was good, but I think this was better. I think we had a great conversation tonight. And, uh, and I appreciate um, all of you and your input. All right, so here's the second part of number six. Somebody said something to me about feeling set up. 
last week. <laughs> I, did, I promise you I didn't set you up. I just couldn't fit it all on one slide. The fact that so many people everywhere have had an actual experience of God makes very likely the existence of such a being who created the world and sustains it. God invites us to know him in our own experience. The triune God promises, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. That's the invitation that all of us on here tonight are giving to you. If you're watching this, it's not by accident. You didn't just stumble across this video online. God is reaching out to you and he's saying, yes, I am real. And I want to get to know you. And more importantly, I want you to get to know me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time tonight in study on the Trinity. We're looking forward to the coming Tuesdays where we're going to get together and really go at it. I can't wait till we have a big disagreement. It's going to be the best night ever because in investigation, you reveal yourself. You ask us, you invite us to come and challenge you and question you. And so God, we're here looking for you, not just to speak while we're recording this, but to speak to everyone who views it and hears it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Please give out that link. I know this on the flyer. It doesn't have a direct Zoom link. I think that's the problem. Some people are texting me all throughout saying they can't get on. Uh, so we're going to try to do a better job with that between now and Tuesday night. God bless you. And we'll see you on next time. Amen. Have a wonderful night. Good night. Good night.